ओम ज्ञान तिमिरंधस्य ज्ञानांजन शलाकाया चक्षुरोन्मिल येना तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे मंचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे 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 कृष्णा सो थैंक यू गौर कुमार प्रभु फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी टुडे आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू बी विद ऑल ऑफ यू थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग एंड we are discussing on the topic of uh, why to worship the hindu gods when they are immoral like krishna or cruel like uh, durga or especially bhadra kali kali so now once to to sort of friends we are discussing and one of them made a point that uh, was not particularly clever but like some people they speak ordinary points but they speak it in a way that they are mouthing some great wisdom so when this friend they made that point this person b said hey, you are a, you are a genius now you can say you are a genius you can say you are a genius now you got a genius can be said in a very sarcastic way also so and this first person said thank you very much he says uh, that was not a compliment he says you know no you can you have a right to speak what you want you don't have a right to decide how i take what you speak <laughs> so he said i take even criticism as a compliment life is much easier that way so why i quote this is uh i was once at a at a, something like a glory of india program organized by a hindu group and they had put quotes by many western thinkers about the glory of india and there are you may have heard quotes by thoreau and emerson about how they appreciate the bhagavad gita and there is there are others also who talk about how india's contributions are quite special so there was one quote over there it says where this they had quoted a western uh, british thinker specifically an english thinker and he said that as far as religion is concerned india is the only millionaire in the world so now actually speaking the person who had written that quote had written in a sarcastic way he meant that that there is there is atheism where one person doesn't accept any god there is monotheism where we accept one god which is what prominently the abrahamic religions are and they often proudly distinguish themselves from the polytheistic religions that existed before them so the greek or roman tradition was largely polytheistic so they equated the what they encountered in india with the greek or roman tradition and they thought that even these hindus this followers of the vedas are also polytheistic but it seems it is not just polytheism it is like there's a polytheism gone imaginative imaginatively mad that there are 33 million gods over there so it is a polit poly, religious imagination that has gone mad so that's what he was talking sarcastically that india is the only millionaire 
so in this glory of india exhibition they didn't know the context why this quote had been made and thought it actually is appreciating india well he was not appreciating india his intention was to criticize however it is not necessarily a criticism why because there is a rationale behind the worship of so many devtas and that rationale is profoundly compassionate so there is a there is a some people may be just too dumb to even recognize that they have been insulted uh, when they are insulted or disrespected but there could be others who may be actually insightful enough to see an appreciation even within a condemnation so why would somebody condemn unless that person considered that person some kind of threat some kind of challenge as it is said that envy is also indirect praise when are we envious of someone when we feel that person is good and we don't want to appreciate that good then we are envious so what is the idea so similarly this this idea oh krishna is immoral and uh, durga uh, kali is cruel so this can seem as criticism and yes it may be intended also as criticism however the fact is that the broad vedic conception of divinity is not restrictive it is very inclusive that the vedic conception of divinity includes the entire spectrum of qualities including qualities which we would normally not consider positive so what is the idea behind this if god is the source of everything which is something that almost all traditions agree with then there has to be in some way present in him the spectrum of things that are manifested in the world now even if we don't want to use the word god and even if we don't want to use the word he because it is male that is okay we can just use the word ultimate reality right now and we'll discuss about the specifics later even if we use the word ultimate reality so the ultimate reality needs to encompass in some way the spectrum of what we see in the world otherwise it is not the ultimate reality so the idea that god can have no negative attributes within him within the ultimate reality cannot have any negative attributes that is actually a negative attribute attributed or imposed on the ultimate reality so if the unlimited is truly unlimited then the unlimited should be able to incorporate and reconcile and reconcile even the attributes that we consider negative but the potency of the unlimited is such that those negative attributes are not something which make the ultimate reality make the deity negative so let's try to understand this from with some examples now imagine if we have a country and that country very proudly says no we are uh, we are a powerful country but we have no police and we are no military okay now we might consider a utopia in which not only are the citizens of that country all law abiding but all its neighbors are also law abiding and therefore it doesn't need a military or a police but the problem with utopias is just that they are utopias they never exist so a country in order to be complete has to have defense internally and externally so the so, so the country's completeness 
cannot be by saying that oh we don't have any defense we don't have any uh, we don't have police or we don't have any military so so yes now most people in today's world may protest that oh why so much money is being spent on defense or why so much money is being spent on xyz so on say on the police department but without those what happens is there are greater problems so in america there was this uh, movement to defund the police now all such movements get associated with uh, certain political positions and the idea that we need to elevate people support people through social social welfare and other things that is fine but the fact is that there has to be law enforcement also so just as a state to be complete needs to have defense and naive conceptions of completeness our state is so good that we don't need any defense at all those are not going to work in real life so the similarly the conception of the divine to be complete integrates negative attributes also so just as the police may use weapons the defense may use weapons but just because they are using weapons does not necessarily make them bad and does not make even the state bad so so now moving forward the vedic conception of divinity is significantly different from the abrahamic conception of divinity the abrahamic religions are those which are starting from mm, having abraham as one of their prominent prophets so that is judaism christianity and islam and in these religions now of course each of these religions are usually have significant differences at the same time there are some underlying commonalities and one of those commonalities is that god is often treated as the other that means this is the world and god is categorically different from the world if we are here in the world and god is beyond the world so <clears throat> that is say for that is one of the reasons for example why in the islamic tradition especially any kind of depiction of the divine of allah can't be done and many muslims extend that further to say that even a depiction of muhammad can't be done mm. so their idea is that the divinity is so much other that no human ability can depict the divinity now the vedic understanding is that yes the divinity is other the divinity exists in a category different from ourselves we are finite the divine is infinite however divinity also permeates all of existence that so if this this is the world and this we say is the other world so divinity exists in the other world but divinity also extends itself to be manifest in this world and by extending the divine presence to permeate the world this becomes the conception of divine becomes much more inclusive so because of that that understanding so divinity is not defined only by its purity oh nothing of the world touches the divine yes that is an attribute of the divine but that is not the only attribute of the divine divinity doesn't just extend beyond the world divinity also permeates the world and thus divinity manifests in forms that may seem mundane that may seem even questionable by mundane means so let's begin with kali now there is the conception of the female divine which is very prominent in the vedic tradition and the female divinity manifest across a spectrum so there is durga who is considered to be the gentle the gentle female divinity she is often considered the maternal female divinity and there is kali 
who is also female but she is considered the opposite of gentle she is considered angry now her anger is also a manifestation of divine compassion how is that because that anger is directed against who that anger is directed against disruptors those who disrupt social order those who are demoniac and those demoniac are destroyed by her so the divine in one sense in the divinity within the vedic tradition is not afraid as they say to make the hands dirty to get involved to actually do the things necessary for dealing with the problems of the world so when demoniac forces overrun the world then it is at times the goddess she takes fighting in her own hands and the idea of kali having her tongue out and then often having a garland of sometimes skulls around her the idea of that is to serve as a divine as a reminder of divine deterrence no deterrence is a very important force in um, in the in the world india for example india and pakistan have had several have had several wars most of the time it was pakistan attacking india but after nuclear weapons were acquired uh, wars have not occurred beyond a particular level so deterrence has its force recently just i met a devotee who escaped from ukraine and that they were saying that, that the, the widespread opinion in ukraine is that we should never have abandoned our nuclear weapons this is not a uh, support for this is not, i'm not supporting nuclear weapons per se but i'm just giving an example of the power of deterrence so through kali by showing that the divine will will subject the demoniac to such a fate is meant to show an example of deterrence so the divine deterrence is manifested through the example of kali so that's one point which i would like to make over here and we could go further so now it is not that followers who go and worship kali they live in constant fear or oh, this is what is going to befall us no that is the police generally when somebody approaches the police they will have fear only if they are criminals generally so similarly the idea of deterrence is required for those who are about to do something wrong those who are pious and who are trying to do the right thing there is that that time the cruel cruelty is not manifested over there the affection the maternality is manifested over there and that's why the her name is not just kali it is bhadra kali bhadra means auspicious now if we move forward from there and then we consider that okay when you said that there was a millionaire what is the idea of that that there is that uh, there are million gods so here also the idea is the vedic conception of divinity is not one zero is not digital that just like in the bible it is said that jesus says i am the way and the light and the truth and none shall go to the father except through me now of course if we go to the original text uh, of the statement which jesus has made so there are a number of reputable scholars of christianity who say that there is a significant word there which has been neglected that is presently at presently none shall go to the father except through me but that has been absolutized so irrespective of without going to the technicalities of that but the point is that it means if somebody is not able to accept one particular path then what is left for them it is left for them that they go to hell so the idea is that 
the exclusivist approach it leaves no room for those in between yes there are people who are open to become uh, become devoted to the divine follow the divine and there are those not ready but it doesn't mean that those who are not ready are necessarily evil so is there a way for those who cannot accept in between okay who is who cannot accept divine is there but they are in between so the vedic understanding is yes there is an understanding of one ultimate reality and that one ultimate reality manifests in different ways and when that one ultimate reality manifests in different ways the idea is that um, that reality manifests for the purpose of enabling people to access the divine so i started earlier by talking about how there is there is um, monotheism there is polytheism the vedic conception of divinity is actually something significantly different and to understand that conception of divinity we need to go beyond categories which are externally imposed so within the uh, vedic tradition there are there are category what happens is when we apply categories which are drawn from somewhere outside then those categories can be limiting and so let's look at this for a minute we consider the gita's profound conception of divinity this is based on the gita and it is going further based on a broader understanding the reaching of vedic tradition so if we consider the approach of a pendulum there is the idea of one only one god which is called as monotheism and there is the idea of many gods which is called as polytheism and those who are monotheistic often claim to be claim a sense of proud superiority over monotheist over polytheist this is you now we worship only one god well atheists take that further and they say yeah we just worship one god less than the monotheists so <laughs> so what happens is is it the idea that yeah monotheism is superior to polytheism well if less is better then zero is better than one that is the atheistic argument so the vedic conception of divinity is there is one god who has many manifestations at many levels and this is best described neither as polytheism nor as monotheism it is polymorphic monotheism monotheism theism is worship of god mono is one there is one ultimate reality but poly is many and morpho morphology as we know is study of form so morphic is form so there is one divinity who manifests in many forms and at many levels and it's not just polymorphic monotheism actually speaking i started earlier by talking about how why should god be male so yes that is a fair fair understanding so there are groups the, the abrahamic religions primarily talk about god as male now there are some traditions which worship god as the mother which worship god as the female and to some extent catholicism uh, incorporated that by talking uh, by elevating virgin mary to a, a a high level or to a pedestal of worship so there is the idea of god is female see the vedic understanding is that god is both because god manifests as divine couples so in the vedic tradition there is sita ram there is lakshmi narayan there is radha krishna so actually the vedic conception of divinity is polymorphic by monotheism there is so there is one theistic one deity who manifests as a divine couple and there are many divine couples like this who manifest so so there is parvati and there is shiva so the idea over here is that divinity manifests at multiple different levels 
And why at different levels? I started by talking about how accessibility. It's not one zero. So the mood of Krishna is that yes, if you can't worship me, that the the Gita is very categorical in declaring that there is one ultimate reality, and that is Krishna. Mm-hmm. That the enlightened understand yoma meva samudho jana ti purushottamam sa sarva vid bhajiti mam sarva bhave na Bharata. So there is a fairly clear understanding of, of one ultimate reality. At the same time, there is also a recognition that this does not necessarily this is not restrictive. That yes, there is one ultimate reality, but that one ultimate reality is not an insecure or jealous divinity who is who is who becomes agitated if someone else is worshipped. That there are people with different mindsets, and because there are people with different mindsets, what happens is different people are attracted to different things. So the the Vedic understanding is that. the divine is so inclusive so compassionate that the divine has other manifestations who are not exactly god but they are not god also they are intermediaries and that is why there we can say there's a god with a small g and there is there are gods with there is god with a capital g and there are gods with a small g and these are technically called as the devatas and these devatas are actually very potent in their own ways for serving the purpose of uplifting everyone based on whatever their present mindset may be so they are everybody is allowed to move forward to connect with the ultimate reality no matter what happens with them no matter so if somebody is attracted not necessarily to a conception of the divine that is completely pure that is completely uh, uh, devoid of any negative attributes any attributes that are con- conventionally considered negative then what happens is such people are also provided space and how are they provided space by giving them by the understanding that the divine has many manifestations and such manifestations include various categories so for example i said there is the idea of gods within the vedic in the abrahamic tradition is the divine is seen as a competitor the abrahamic conception is there is one god and that god is considered jealous and that's why that god doesn't want us to worship any other gods uh, so that is the abrahamic concession where other gods are considered as competitors they are considered as false gods to be rejected to worship the one true god but in the vedic conception it is understood that these other de- other deities they are assistants so god manifests over a spectrum and he has personal expansions and he has others who act on his behalf as a surrogates that there are that there true godly beings who assist in service to reach the supreme being so had the understanding that there is one one divinity now this is the broad gita's understanding and we could go deeper into this but the idea is that there is krishna there is vishnu then there are the shavataras and then beyond that within the for the maintenance of the so, so the vishnu over here is transcendental exists in a trans divine abode the idea of avatar is one who descends to the world and then there are devatas who are primarily in charge of the maintenance of the world that is brahma vishnu mahesh you see and then beyond that there are so many other devatas there is ganesh there is durga and there is kali and all these deities what they are all existing in one spectrum and the idea is krishna in the bhagavad gita says that it if somebody cannot be at one they don't have to be at zero that is the implication over there is this is a profound system and we won't go into the 
details of that. This is Dr. Krishna talks about from 7.20 to 23 in the Bhagavad Gita. And his idea is that he includes everyone in the worship. He, he, play, he gives everyone an opportunity to connect with divinity in some way at some level of manifestation. So I will give two, make two points and then we'll conclude and we can have question answers. So uh, the Vedic conception of divinity is God is not jealous. God is zealous. Zealous means is and he is diligently striving not for one's own glorification but for others welfare for others elevation for the elevation of all living beings now many of you may know the story of the prodigal son which comes in the old testament and the idea is that uh, that there was a father who was wealthy who was like a landlord who was almost like a sovereign a king over there and he had a lot of wealth one of his sons demanded his own share of the inheritance. He said, I don't want to live with you. So he took his inheritance, went away, tried to live on his own, but he squandered all the wealth and eventually ended up in poverty, in distress. And he had to become a menial laborer doing extremely hard work. And finally, he decided, let me go back to my father. So even my father treats his laborers better than I'm being treated here. When he came back, he was welcomed with great joy by his father. So in the, in the Abrahamic tradition, this story is told to indicate how loving God is. That even like that father who welcomed his son, the prodigal means wasteful. The prodigal son came back and he was accepted. And God is so accepting that is talked about. And that is true. That God is accepting. The Vedic understanding is that God doesn't just wait and accept when the child, when the when the son, lost son comes back. Actually, God, wherever this lost son goes, there God Himself also goes, and there also God tries to elevate the person. So the understanding is. That if somebody is just in this in the materialistic conception of like having no care for any anything divine, so that's like a person, this prodigal son who has gone away to another kingdom, and is uh, another landlord's place and is working under a very exploitative person, and that person is distressed. So what happens is that is like a materialistic conception of living. We have no idea of any ultimate reality, and life is tough. People, there's a cutthroat competition. People are out to exploit. So we live in that world. And what uh, so now the in this case of the prodigal son, if we extend that metaphor further to include the how compassion the Vedic conception of divinity is, that God does not simply wait. The king sends. Okay, he sends his own minister. So this is a big landlord. He has a landlord under him. He sends his own, the king, the landlord, the king, he sends his own ministers. And this the, the son is not ready to come back to the father right now. So the, son, the father sends a representative whom the son may not know and the son may therefore not be averse to him. And there what happens is, hey, you are working for this person and you are finding their expert, you work for me. You know, I'll give him a better deal. And the minister slowly draws the son back into the kingdom of the father. So this kind landlord who is offering employment to the prodigal son is, is in one sense different from the father. Because there is a different person. But another sense is non-different from the father because he's connected with the father. And he is pursuing the purpose of the father that is to bring about reconciliation and reunion between the father and the son. So that is the idea of devata worship. The worship of the devatas involves not just the, uh, just the, it's not polytheistic because the polytheism has the idea that there are multiple divinities and they're all fighting with each other. It is not like that. They're all in one harmonious arrangement for the elevation of everyone. So the devatas, 
yes occasionally there may be some leela some incidents where some conflicts may come up but overall they are in a harmonious purposeful synergy the devtas are like the ministers in the cosmic administration who who act as intermediaries who act as surrogates for those souls who are not ready to turn back to the ultimate reality ultimately and then as this uh, this person who is this prodigal son who is employed by this kind landlord he says okay this person is quite good my new landlord is good but okay this new lord also is new landlord seems to be subservient to someone subordinate to someone and who is that so that is that is the king and then he says okay the king offers is better to be with the king i don't want to be with the king uh, and go to the palace but maybe i work over there that's better and then the, the prodigal son starts working with the king as an employee you know the king doesn't wants a, a transactional relationship a king doesn't want a business relationship with the son but at least that's better than nothing so that is like mixed devotion where one approaches the ultimate reality for the purpose of gaining something mundane from it and that's also better than no relationship and from there when the son comes back to the father's home then that is a reunion based on love and that is like pure love for god it is it is not that god deprives of material things but the basis of the relationship with god, god is not the provision of our, of our material desires of our worldly cravings so in this way divinity spans the entire spectrum of human existence so when i talked about the otherness of god in the abrahamic traditions that is like the father being very uh, very loving and willing but waiting in the own kingdom you come back to me whereas here divinity extends beyond the other world beyond the kingdom of god and extends into this world also so the cruelty is actually not cruelty it is at one level it is necessary for maintaining order and deterrence in the world at another level there are people who are attracted to that kind of thing and should such people not have an opportunity to connect with the divine no they are also included in the scope of connecting with the divine by a div- the by a surrogate manifestation of the divine which will be which will be appealing to them so that's why in one sense we could say the vedic conception of divinity is not just inclusive it is in one sense user friendly user friendly in the sense that okay you cannot worship that one true god well there is divinity manifesting in many different ways and as far as krishna's immorality is concerned as we talked about the uh, kali's cruelty and krishna's immorality the idea is that we need to consider the actions of a person so certain actions of krishna may be considered immoral say for example that he there are the he has uh, some he guides arjuna to do certain things which are which seem to be questionable in the mahabharat war in his childhood he steals butter it when the uh, when people who are very deeply grounded in the abrahamic world view they came to india they came to north india especially mathura and they saw many murals and others of krishna stealing butter yes what is this who is this this is uh, and what is going on over here this is this is god and what is he doing he's stealing butter you know they just got intellectually short circuited on hearing that <laughs> okay and, you know what is god doing as a child and why is he stealing and if he has to steal why butter among all things so uh, the idea is that krishna as makhan chor is is chor but he is normally normally if somebody is a thief that is not considered to be something which will be praised for hmm? generally if somebody gets involved in something which is criminal that comes on their record and they want to hide it constantly because otherwise they will not have employment prospects their social prospects will be limited 
So, uh, so why is it that Krishna is glorified as Makanchuk? Is not trying to hide it at all. The idea is yes, there is some something which could be called as robbery, but it is not motivated by selfishness. It is not motivated by anything uh, which is for one's own self-interest at the cost of others' interests. The idea is that. At one level, everything belongs to God. So even if he wants to take anything, it is his only. But when Krishna takes butter, what is he doing? The, the cowherd maidens who make the butter, they, they all love Krishna. And they can, Krishna can go straight to them and ask them for butter. And they will happily give. But when Krishna does mischievous things like this, that brings greater joy to them. Now, if we, if those, uh, if we are parents, now we want our parents like to talk about their children, and when children sometimes behave in contrary ways, then that adds to the endearment of the child, endearing feelings towards the child. So when Krishna steals butter, he's this is just a leela wherein he is increasing the affectionate bond between him and his devotees. And that is why he's celebrated as Makanchur. That's why he's celebrated as the stealer of butter. He's not actually stealing butter. The butter represents the love of his devotees and the efforts that they have made with the love. So the love of their hearts and the labor of their hands. It labor of their hands in churning. Both of it come, both of them combined together. In the manifestation of butter, and when Krishna takes the butter, he is actually stealing their hearts, and is bonding at a greater level of love with them. So it is not. We could say generally there are three levels. There is moral, and there is something which is below moral that is immoral, mm -hmm. and then there is something which is above moral that is transmoral. So transmoral is that which is done. Uh, which may resemble the immoral, but actually it is not. Because now we could go into a different, a whole big ethical discussion of what is immoral. So primarily immorality is not just in the action. Immorality is in the intention. Hmm? Of course, there is a sophisticated ethical debate, but when somebody is not motivated by any selfish, any self-interest, any selfish desire, then generally speaking, morality, rules of morality are given so that people don't succumb to selfish, uh, people don't indulge in their selfish desires and their greed, in their exploitativeness, in their anger. So Krishna as the divine has none of those. But when he acts in such ways, he, although he's transmoral, he seems to act in ways that are immoral. Why is that? At one level, it attracts the hearts of his devotees because the, the, there is contrary lila. But on another level, those who are attracted to such things, those who are attracted to such things, they find, oh, the divinity also, the divine also robs. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, many, of, uh, many of the devotees in India, as well as in other places in Europe, even to some extent in America, we do prison outreach. And one of the things we talk about is that the conception of divinity in the, in the bhakti tradition is so inclusive that Krishna is actually born in a jail. Krishna is born in a jail and Krishna robs, but his robbing is transcendental. Now, similarly, when Krishna does something unethical, I'll conclude with this quickly, that and say Krishna shot Karana. Krishna told Arjuna to shot Karana when Karana, or Karana's chariot had sunk into the ground. That can seem immoral. So what happens over there is Karana himself says, no Arjuna, don't entertain thoughts entertained by coward. Remember the codes of morality and desist from fighting. And Arjuna accordingly lowered his bow. At that time, Krishna told Karana, oh Karana, Fortunate is it that today you remember the codes of morality. Was it morality 
by which you suggested that Draupadi be disrobed? Was it the same code of morality by which you ganged with five other warriors to attack the 16-year-old Abhimanyu and eventually become the cause of his death? Was it morality by which you connived with the Kauravas to send the Pandavas and their mother to Varanavar to attempt to have them burned alive? Was it morality by which you participated in instigating a rigged gambling match in which Yudhishthira was pitted against Shakuni and lost everything? He said, if that was morality, Arjuna will use today that same morality. And Arjuna will say to Arjuna, shoot. Now, it's significant. I, uh, I have a whole uh, analysis in an article, which Gaur Kumar Prabhu can give for those who want. How Arjuna and Karna had many encounters and Karna didn't, was not able to defeat Arjuna even once. Whereas Arjuna defeated Karna twice, at least twice, depending on how we analyze certain results. But uh, but the point is that it is not because Arjuna could not defeat Karna that Krishna told Arjuna to do this. Krishna's point was that Shatho Shatyam, that the world of the real world is such that sometimes with the cunning one needs to be cunning. And that real world ethics are being demonstrated by Krishna over here. And so uh, now we may say, but uh, there was this question which I noticed, you know, why is God practicing eye for an eye? Well, it's not exactly eye for an eye. If that is all that God were doing, then that would be vengeful. But we could say there is there are, there's a difference between, between retaliation. Retaliation is one thing, which is if we just continue that, it will keep escalating. But the opposite of retaliation is not letting the other person dominate. There is, like we say, there is aggressive and there is passive. And in between, there is assertive. So a person who is aggressive is, can often easily become vindictive, vengeful, that's unhealthy. But a person who is passive, they'll be walked over by others, they'll be exploited by others. So, that, so Krishna, he himself goes as the peace messenger with the most accommodating of peace proposals to Duryodhan. And he says the Pandavas actual, the idea was the Pandavas were entitled to the whole kingdom because Yudhishthira was the heir. But the starting proposal itself was, forget the whole kingdom. Let's let the Pandavas have their rightful half of the kingdom. And he agreed with that starting point, which itself was a concession. And from there, Krishna went and said that just give the Pandavas five villages. They're Kshatriyas, they're administrators. They need something to rule. So give them five villages. And Duryodhan dismissively and derisively rejected even that. So he sealed his own fate over there. The idea is that <clears throat> Krishna didn't desire war. Krishna didn't desire violence. Uh, Krishna sought peace in every possible way. But there are people who will never agree to peace, no matter what they do. So such people need to be curbed. And that, that there is one, one ultimate reality and that ultimate reality manifests in different ways. So there is forgiveness, which is, uh, and for, uh, forgiveness that is one aspect of the divine. However, forgiveness is offered for those who are ready to reform. If somebody is not ready to reform, you know, forgiveness being given to those who are having no inclination of reforming. Now, that is not kindness, that is foolishness. Is it? If there are some criminals, there are some terrorists, and the police are chasing them, and the police have caught them, and the, suddenly the criminal says, oh, please forgive me, please forgive me. And the police lower their weapon and the criminals pick up their, raise their weapon and shoot the police and kill the police. 
So forgiveness for those who are those who are malleable and those who are incorrigible, that is not kindness, that is foolishness. Now, of course, the Vedic conception is much more subtle that we are all souls. And even when somebody is, somebody is killed in this life, that is not they are con that doesn't mean they are condemned forever. The soul gets a fresh start in a future life and the soul moves on. So in that sense, it's not immorality at all. So it is actually transmoral. When Krishna does something questionable, he is, he is himself pure. But as I said, he doesn't let, he doesn't avoid getting his hands dirty. So Krishna is not concerned primarily with maintaining a reputation of purity. That I never, I will never do anything immoral and nobody will be able to accuse me of doing anything immoral. Krishna's concern is how best can I establish order in the world? How can I est establish dharma in the world? How can I attract others to me? Others to transcendence, others to spiritual elevation and whatever is required for that, he is ready to do that. That is his uh, inclusive compassion. And thus, he is not immoral, but transmoral. Uh, so I'll summarize what I discussed today. We covered a lot of territory. But I started first by discussing how the idea that God is a millionaire, that India is a millionaire in religion, it is a compliment. Is it? It was meant to be a criticism, but actually it is a compliment. Why? Because it points to the the inclusiveness, the breadth of the conception of the divine and the conception of the divine and the compassion of the divine. So the conception of the divine in the Abrahamic traditions is other. God exists in a category of complete purity and therefore there can be nothing negative attributable to God. While that is true in the Vedic tradition, God doesn't just exist in another domain, but God exists into this domain, expand, extends into this domain also and manifest in a way that can reach out to people. So there I talked about the categories of monotheism and polytheism don't apply because the Vedic understanding is best explained as polymorphic by monotheism. There's one divine who manifests at many levels in many different forms and they manifest as a divine couple. And the idea here is that rather than having one zero, you worship this God or you're condemned. It is okay if you can't worship this 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 vision of divinity. Divinity manifests in many different ways, and whichever vision you are attracted to, there is a way to way forward. So I talked about the prodigal son story, and how God is not just waiting at home for the son to come back, but rather God is extending his reach to wherever this wherever the soul is presently. And offering some connection and access at that level. And that means that some, so Kali's apparent violence, it serves two purposes. One is the administrative purpose of deterrence. So those who are serious wrongdoers, that's what she does to them. The idea is that a divine is not afraid to get the hands dirty. But the other is for those who are attracted to that kind of imagery, that kind of activity, even they, there is a place within divinity for them. And then Krishna, when he's, he's, he steals, his stealing may seem immoral, but is transmoral. Because it is not stealing to deprive others of physical possessions. It is stealing to enrich others with spiritual, enrich others' hearts with spiritual devotion. It is a reciprocation of love. Krishna has no selfishness within him. And even when he does something which seems to be moral, like uh, the, uh, asking Arjuna to kill Karana, when he's not fighting, his, his chariot is un, uh, stuck. So that is, yes, it may seem immoral in some way, but Krishna is demonstrating the necessities of functioning in the world that sometimes with the cunning, one has to be cunning. So Krishna did not tell Arjuna to do anything to Karana which was any worse than what Karana had repeatedly done to Arjuna and his loved ones. So, um, so, so the idea is the divine extends exists beyond the world, but extends into this world also. And that is the inclusive compassion of the divine. There's one divinity 
manifesting at many levels in many forms to all meant for one purpose one synergistic purpose to elevate humanity towards spiritual perfection towards liberation towards eternal life thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna prabhu thank you so much uh, do you have some time for questions prabhu yes yes definitely so mega please go ahead thank you so much prabhu for for giving like such profound view on uh, bimorphic polytheism <laughs> mm, so polymorphic uh, yeah poly polymorphic yes yeah go ahead <laughs> uh so my question is uh, so god is so divine or infinite and god created this world so why god created and god is behind all the creation whether good or bad or like disruptors or non disruptors so why god created these disruptors in this world and then trying to have some order like why not to actually create utopia in the first place okay that's a good question mm-hmm. the idea is that why uh, why can't god uh, why does god allow or create disruptors why not create utopia well first of all what is utopia utopia we may say it's a place where everything is perfect but you know everything is not everything everything includes people and people have free will so god does not make anyone evil or bad at the same time he gives everyone free will and he doesn't take it away uh, actually the purpose of existence ultimately is the reciprocation of love so that we love each other and we love the supreme lord and we have a eternal uh, joyous relationship that is that is the understanding of what we might call as utopia what in the spiritual traditions is called as the spiritual world this is a loving union loving bond between the as in the divine and between all of us as part of one divine family and the, that's the idea of sudaiva kutumb kutumbakam also and now the challenge is here is that love cannot be forced mm-hmm. love has to be voluntary and he, although god is omnipotent he doesn't force anyone to love him so if somebody chooses not to love him then he respects that free will that does not mean that that person can do anything and everything there are principles of karma by which there is some regulation however the point is that if there is force then there cannot be any love so that's why the idea of the perfect world for some people the perfect world is where everybody is forced to do the right thing but then is that perfect if there is no freedom there is no liberty so the spiritual world is not like that everybody has freedom now f- there are some souls who choose not to live in harmony with the divine and for such souls the present world that we are in exists so that tendency to not to to seek not harmony but disharmony that is not god's creation that is actually the choice of certain souls and that choice is what creates uh, the various levels of disorder and dysfunction and even disaster that we see in the world however god doesn't abandon such souls also he is with them helping them come back to harmony so a part of the perfection of god's creation we could say is giving people free will and then that free will sometimes is misused but he doesn't abandon such people he allow he gives them he, he gives them a space to play out their free will that's why the purpose of this world in terms of the gita especially 15.7 we could say is twofold it is experimentation and reorientation that in the world there are different people who try out different things oh this will make me happy that will make me happy that will make me happy so okay try it out experimentation and when 
we try it out and we realize oh all these things yeah they give some pleasure but eventually they are unfulfilling they are frustrating mm-hmm. then what is it that really fulfills my heart and that is where the reorientation happens that is where the soul comes in returns to loving harmony with the lord so that because of that free will in the intermediate time there is some disorder okay thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. Thank you. So, so Darshan Prabhu has a question on the chat. Uh, he's yeah, willing to I saw that, yes. Right? So he wants to unmute. And, so Darshan Prabhu, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Prabhu. It was very profound and I really loved how you described the different of um, you know, God concepts in Abrahamic and Dharmic traditions. And uh, pertaining to that, actually, this is a question that has been bothering me for quite some years now that with, um, you know, the concepts so different in abrahamic and dharmic traditions can there ever be peace because that is something that we have consistently seen never happening because um, the abrahamic okay. faiths as we know always you know have their own perception and cannot think beyond that and uh, um yeah i got the know. question yep. so okay. when there is the conception of the divine is so different can there be harmony well let's try to understand more clearly what causes disharmony so there is there are two distinct concepts over here there is exclusivism and there is extremism and the two are not the same thing Ex- exclusivism is more in terms of conceptions it is oh okay it is our conception of the divine that is the only right conception uh, that so exclusivism is in terms of beliefs and extremism is in terms of actions if you look at it over here extre- ex- extremism is where one becomes intolerant one becomes fanatical one becomes violent towards others so yes it is there is a slippery slope by which one can slide from exclusivism towards extremism but it is not necessary if it were that exclusivism intrinsically leads to extremism then there would be constant violence there is of course violence in the history of the world but it's not that there is constant violence because what happens is people's actions are not determined solely by their by their ideological beliefs alone even by their religious beliefs alone so for example if we consider from the left's perspective there's communism and communism is quite exclusivist in the idea that all of human history is just been class struggle and the only solution is that we have to eliminate all classes only then there will be harmony but then there is a milder version of communism that has come that is socialism which says okay we also want to remove class but we will do it through democracy and there is there is a spectrum so the bhagavad gita does not talk about religions like hinduism in terms of hinduism christianity islam it talks about human beings in terms of their psychological profiles in terms of their psychological and behavioral characteristics and it talks about three modes three guna sattva rajas and tamas goodness passion and ignorance so what that means is that within every tradition there will be people in sattva sattva are people who are thoughtful they think and then they act carefully there are people who in rajas they are a little bit more impulsive if something is desirable they act and they think later and in tamas in the mode of ignorance people get obsessed with one thing alone and then they forget everything else that one thing becomes their solitary obsession so if i talk about it over here so in terms of religious conceptions in sattva there is focus on commonality while there is acknowledgement of difference so those in sattva yes we have many common things like even in a abrahamic tradition if somebody is that it's not that everybody is in a one particular mode it's not the same true that in in the vedic tradition also different people are in different modes so in sattva 
If somebody is a Tua, they will acknowledge, yes, my, my theology is different from yours. But still, there is commonality. We are striving for some higher meaning and purpose in life. We are striving for, to look for something enduring. So there will be focus on commonality while acknowledgement of difference. In Rajas, there will be focus on difference while there may be some acknowledgement of commonality. Hmm. Uh, so, so, they, so in Rajas, in the mode of passion, there is a greater possibility of conflict. In Tamas, there's only obsession on one thing, one characteristic which is made the ultimate thing. To make one thing into everything. So yes, according to my theology, this is right and you are wrong. So, so this is where it is in Tamas that extremism comes up. So there may be people who may be having exclusivist beliefs. But if they are in Sattva, if they are in Rajas, they will not degenerate towards extremism. But what happens is, uh, if we consider, so what is the cause of extremism? What is the cause of violence? Some people say that uh, they will try to say that there is no religious cause at all. It's only social, social, political, economic, geopolitical, historical causes. This is why people in this area are becoming violent. So, for example, if you consider the Kashmir Files movie, they try to at least the way they uh, the history that was untold was told over there, how the uh, brutal depravities of the terrorists was whitewashed. Now, it is all because the Indian state was so oppressive. What could they do except raise a weapon? Well, okay. Well, the, the Muslim extremists were so violent toward the Kashmiri Hindus, but they didn't raise weapons. So to say that that is the only cause and there's no theological cause for it. That is one extreme. But the other extreme is to say there's only theological, that the, it's only because they're Muslims, they became terrorists. So Muslims become terrorists. No, there is Islam, which is very big, in which there are people in Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. And there is Islamic extremism, where there are people who are prominently in Tamas, prominently in the mode of ignorance, who are in power. So when there is violence, there is extremism, there's a complex bend of theological and non-theological causes. Theological cause is a part of it. To say that it is not a part of it is to ignore reality, to deny reality, to, to be, have put blinders on. But to say that the theological cause is the only cause is also to put a blind drone. Because then why isn't everybody acting like that? If that so exclusivism doesn't lead to extremism always. It leads when there is tamas. So let's put it another way. What happens is we shouldn't rush to judgment. So it will when will exclusivism lead to extremism? You can look in terms of the diagram. What happens is if there are followers in tamas and there are leaders in tamas. That means the followers obsess, oh, you know, according to our theological, now that is also one reading of the theology, one understanding of theology. There are Christians also who are quite inclusive. There are Christians who differentiate between Jesus and Christ. They say Jesus is a particular manifestation of Christ who is the ultimate deity. And Christ manifests in different ways. So if the followers are in tamas and the leaders are in tamas, then that is most disastrous. That is where that is where hell can hell can un, un, unfold on the earth. Now, if the followers are in tamas, but the leaders are not in tamas, the leaders are mature, they will at least sooner or later bring the followers under control. If the, the so that is bad, at least followers are in tamas. But if the leaders are in tamas and the followers are not in tamas, then that's still worse because the leaders will incite people. And that will, that, that will also, some pe people will get indoctrinated, people will get uh, radicalized. And the best is where neither are in tamas. Now that is not humanly possible. However, if a, if a significant number of the leaders are in sattva or rajas, preferably in sattva, and a significant number of people, even followers are in sattva or rajas, not tamas, then that is, that is good. And that can happen in various ways. One is, of course, there has to be, wherever there is extremism, there has to be a proportionate response. 
that means uh, we cannot put on kid gloves when dealing with extremism there has to be strong uh, response to control that but at the same time the solution will be that we could say those people who are in sattva even in a religion which has exclusivism as a theology there will be people in sattva and they will broadly be the moderates so if to counter extremism we cannot if we presume that everyone in a particular group is extremist well that is that is a rush to judgment it is not true that everyone will be in tamas and be extremist but to say that oh the extremists are a tiny fringe well maybe maybe not in some places they may be a tiny fringe but in some places they may not be they may be the they may be a influential minority a vocal minority aggressive minority sometimes and some some places they may be actually the majority also so we have to look we have to analyze according to time place circumstance according to situation and act appropriately so to if you want to counter extremism what we ultimately needed is we need to fo- if we uh, if you want tolerance we need to focus on if you suppose only interacts with the moderates and they say that oh you know uh, you people why are you so why are you so oh, so so ex uh, so judgmental no they are all there are good people there also so it's ironical that what happens is people who f- interact with those who are sattva and with moderates and they say don't be judgmental don't be judgmental like there is this whole uh, phenomena of the fear of islam of islamophobia and yes you don't want uh, aversion or negativity towards any particular community at the same time the point is that there are there have been extremist actions and that's why there is fear so we don't want smoke the point is not don't condemn everyone who is calling out smoke 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 extinguish the fire the smoke will also go away and then nobody will and then you can really find out people who are who are bent on being alarmist and calling out smoke when there is no smoke and when there is no fire so the idea is yes there can be islamophobia but that is also because there is islamic extremism so deal with extremism and the islamophobia will substantially decrease so those who say that don't be judgmental now quite often these people are extremely judgmental towards those who are judgmental Hmm? they say you are condemned how can you be so judgmental so we can't see only the moderates and say the extremists are not there and we can't only l- reduce our community to extremists what we need to do is this moderates need to be empowered and the extremists need to be disempowered so when that is done when the moderates are empowered that means we aid in the rising of sattva in various communities or at least the curbing of tamas so when that uh, mentality of obsessing over one thing is decreased then it is definitely possible that there can be harmony with then there will not be paradise it's not that there will be utopia but certainly the levels of disharmony can be substantially decreased okay thank you so much prabhu that made a lot of sense thank you hari krishna so thank so thank you prabhu please go ahead. Oh, Hare Krishna Prabhu, uh, thanks a lot for the wonderful lecture and it's amazing just to be in a live session with you. And I had a question uh, uh, along the similar line, same as the question Prabhu, that Krishna provides everyone an opportunity to love him through his different forms. So can like other religions as well be considered as a way, like extension of this love? Definitely. uh shri prabhupad talked about how various religious traditions ultimately are an ex- that there are humans all over the world inside and outside the vedic tradition path who have some kind of spiritual aspiration who want to raise their consciousness upwards to find greater meaning and purpose in life to find something und- enduring and uh, there are people like that and there are paths provided for them so yes uh, in one sense prabhupad said even jesus or mohammed they were at the in their own way at their own level doing the work of god to elevate human consciousness now so in that sense there are many different ways to approach 
approach the ultimate reality and different religions are also means to approach the ultimate reality it depends on the individual seekers and it depends on the individual the leaders that are present at those for, to guide those seekers how far ahead along that journey people will go okay thank you robo that was very enlightening thank you uh, leka mata ji um hari krishna prabhu thank you so much uh, for the lecture it was full of um, insights thank you for that um my question was so you were you were telling about how um krishna you know even even if it causes deformation like he steals butter to like attract devotees and you know mm. in whatever way he can connect and then there are also other statements in shastras that says how krishna is aloof um which is kind of like scary for me when when i read that statement i i'm sure i don't understand it correctly so what does it mean if when krishna's aloof um in 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 the material happenings of our life like um okay yeah that's a good question so we say krishna is engaged but then krishna is also aloof so if you consider the bhagavad gita udasina vad asinam krishna says that i am situated at the word udasin means detached in fact you can go further and say is indifferent but that can seem quite alarming is god indifferent to our plight in this world but he is saying udasina vad vad means as if like he is not indifferent he is more of uh, so to understand uh, how god's role in this world is that it there are two distinct aspects to it see one is in we can have two words in english which sound similar that is disinterested and there is uninterested so uninterest although they sound similar and sometimes they are used as synonyms there is a significant difference uninterested means one has no interest in the subject itself say so somebody is distracted is talking about politics and i'm not interested in this i'm uninterested but disinterested means it refers to unbiased disinterested now we we don't uh, say if a cricket match is going on and there's an umpire and the ball goes and hits the leg and everybody appeals how's that and the umpire says you know i was not watching the match really what were you doing then what is of you he say i'm not interested in cricket then why are you being an umpire is it the umpire cannot be uninterested but the umpire needs to be disinterested the umpire should not be favoring one team and just accepting all their appeals even when the player is not, batsman is not out or the appeal is not valid so when the udasina vad is used it indicate that krishna is disinterested not uninterested he is not biased against anyone he is not biased for anyone but if somebody takes more interest in connecting with him he reciprocates so he is not partial he is reciprocal so he so his that word udasina vad that sometimes the word aloof may be used but that aloof is more in the sense of disinterested it is not in the sense of uninterested or uncaring okay thank you very much prabhu thank you krishna um do you have time for a couple more questions prabhu yes sure okay vinay prabhu please go ahead hari krishna prabhu ji thank you so much for the amazing class i think it gave us like perspective to look at the contemporary religions and how we can uh, see like and see them in the light of like what we are practicing so th- thank you so much prabhu and the slides which and every slides like it's super helpful uh, so so my question i have a question around like divine deterrence prabhu so this concept is in i mean is in all the religions like in abrahamic religions as well or in hindu religion so for example the whatever so jews have been persecuted like since many centuries and and, and then there is thinking that it's a divine deterrence because they offended jesus christ or uh some like and in in muslim among muslim this is thinking that it's a divine deterrence that uh, um, the other people of other religions especially like those who are practicing idolatry and other practices for those who are non muslim they suffered as kafirs because 
uh, it's a divine deterrence it's a divine deterrence for them not, not being practicing their religion or even among the hindu communities like um, if you see the his- if we see the history that the the shudras like who were persecuted like it's it was considered kind of a community uh, a group a sect of people as a divine deterrence for because of their some some position so this i mean uh, so how we can understand in, in this divine deterrence in a right way because uh, i mean okay. whatever happened with the jews or that's a like, good question yeah that's very good see so sometimes when certain communities suffer and suffer terribly sometimes it may be said that this is just this is just the divine arrangement this is god's punishment for them or god's justice for them because of what they did so jews may be persecuted because uh, because they were at least partly responsible that's what is seen for the crucifixion of jesus or something like that yes now first of all there is a very big difference between deterrence and retribution Hmm. deterrence is preventive the very word deter is to prevent someone from doing something so that means i was using the word say nuclear weapons it's not that somebody uses nuclear weapons and say that is deterrence no deterrence means the very fear of the use of nuclear weapons stops the other person from doing something so the deterrence is very different from aggression level on retribution aggression means i attack retribution means You know, you have done this. Therefore, I am going to do this to you. So, singling out any community f- for all time to come for some supposed historical wrongs that they may have done in the past, so that is not in any sense justice. Because something which somebody has done, maybe fifty years ago, hundred years ago, thousand years ago, now why should that whole community be singled out for that? A community for all time. be persecuted for that so it is relatively uh, easy for people to justify the status quo in the world by saying that it is divine will that means this discrimination is there and this uh, persecution is there oh that is just god's arrangement it's not that simple it's not that simple because the things that happen in the world are are we could say allowed by god but they are not necessarily desired by god so there is a difference so this like in one sense if you see in every country there is a difference between what is legal and what is desirable people are given leeway to do things which are some some things are undesirable hmm. so for example even if the government understands that say consumption of uh, particular substance consumption of alcohol or at least particular kinds of drugs or something is bad but it's not necessary that everything which is undesirable unhealthy has to be made illegal hmm. so similarly within uh, there are some which are extreme which are made illegal there is a room for free will yes this is not good but that's what you want to do that's your capacity to do it so but uh, eventually there will be a stop to it so but the idea is that to move towards that which is healthy that which is feasible that which is desirable voluntarily not by force so so similarly there are many things which god allows but that doesn't mean he desires it he wants it because he has also given us free will and because sometimes we may use that free will we mean some people may use that free will wrongly and he allows within a limited jurisdiction for people to use that free will wrongly that's why just we can't claim the status quo as it is to be god's will it is sanctioned by god but that doesn't mean it is desired by god there, there so the idea is that we should all strive to rise towards sattva and beyond sattva so if there is injustice that injustice needs to be corrected otherwise we could say that when sita was look at our own tradition when sita was kidnapped 
Sita was abducted or when Draupadi was dishonored. You say, all this is divine, well, let it happen. The idea is that there is the concept of duty. We have to see what is our duty in this situation. What is ma- our dharma? If a, if a citizen goes to a king and says, or a head of state or a, um, any law administrator and says, I've been robbed. And the citizen says, you know, whatever happens is God's will. The king says, you are robbed, that is God's will. Accept it. Well, okay, God's will is not just about things that happen. God's will is also about what we do. Okay, it might have been God's will that I be robbed, but what is God's will for you? That means, see, there are, in terms of Vedic parlance, there is karma. Different people have their own karma. But when somebody is in distress, those who are, we could say, in positions of responsibility, like in this case, the king. The king, king, it is not the king's business to engage in theology and think what is this piece of person's karma that the person has been robbed. The king's business is to act practically. What is my dharma right now? Not what is whose karma. My dharma is to be a protector of citizens. So if there is a thief who is robbing, then I have to stop it. After the king does due diligence and still somehow the thieves slip away, then they may say, oh, it was your karma to be robbed and accept it. So sometimes despite our efforts to try to avoid a distress, so, so for example, say so Jews may still, ex- ex- uh, there is anti-Semitism which is still there. But anti-Semitism which is there now is very different from the anti-Semitism that lead to the Holocaust. Mm. Now, everybody who ex- experiences certain uh, amount of persecution, they often compare themselves to the Holocaust. Even in the um, Kashmir Files movie, they, they, it is the Kashmiri Hindus Holocaust, it's, uh, it's compared to the Holocaust. Well, the Holocaust was in a different scale. You know? there, have been pogr- there have been killings of people more appropriate would be to call it ethnic cleansing. Now, Holocaust was unique in human history where it brought industrial efficiency to mass murder. Hmm. That has not been done anywhere else. In the Soviet, Russia and China, more people were killed than in the Holocaust. But it was not done with industrial efficiency. So it happened over 60, 70 years. People are killed. So my point I'm making is that, yes, I, there, there could be anti-Semitism, persecu- there is negativity towards Jews is always there. But there is definitely a difference in degree. Jews are not living like they were living in the time of the Holocaust, about in the fear of being destroyed in gas chambers. And if something like that is happening, that has to be stopped. But if people have certain biases, they will take time to be cured. So the point I'm making is, when there is a distressful situation, there is uh, the people in authority have to consider what is my dharma. And we have to do the duty. So the duty of this, if there is active persecution of a particular community, whether in India it is of lower castes, if they are actively being persecuted, then that has to be stopped by the state, by the correct authority. They can't say that it is your karma because of this happening. Because it is, it is God's arrangement. No, you have to take care of what is in your responsibility. And despite diligent efforts by the individual, by the state, by, by various uh, involved forces, if things don't change, then at that time, okay, this, this is something which I have to accept and live with. That will, may change gradually. Uh, so acceptance of the situation, it is, that doesn't mean that that is the only way to see God's will in a particular situation. Sometimes it may be God's will that we be a part of changing the situation. So justifying the status quo is not necessarily, is very rarely uh, our right understanding of theology, whether it is the philosophy of karma within the Vedic tradition or whether it is God's will. But after making efforts to set the situation right, if it is not set right, then accepting it. Yes, sometimes some things may not work. So if a patient is sick and they go to a doctor and the doctor says, you know, it's your karma, you're suffering, continue suffering. That would be heartless. And the doctor's dharma is to try to treat the patient. 
Now, sometimes even after treating, sometimes the disease is just not diagnosed properly. Sometimes the patient doesn't get cured, and that can be said to be okay. It's one's karma. Maybe it's God's will that this person is not uh, not to be cured. Maybe they have to still live with the sickness for some time. So it's after human effort is done, not without human effort. Just passive acceptance is not the right course of action. Does it answer the question? Yes, yes, Prabhu. It's really insightful, and I got like yeah, clarity on the how to think about. Thank you. This. So much. Hey, Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Last, last question. Samaksh Prabhu, please go ahead. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Excellent lecture and excellent questions. Thank you. It's it's been a, a amazing decision to join this lecture, and I'm so fortunate to listen to you directly on a Zoom call. So, Prabhu, I have a question which is in two parts. So, uh, yeah. So, first part is. Uh, can we say that we have so many gods in the vedic religion uh, because as a human being we have different propensity different nature and different dharma so different gods give us an opportunity to find at least one god which with which with whom we can relate to and find and uh, ultimately worship that god to realize the ultimate godhead and second part of the question is like what happens when we worship a deva or uh, another some other form of uh, the god and not krishna so okay yeah that's a good question and the basic points are valid that as i said that the you, the the vedic conception of divinity and vedic spirituality in general can be vedic, um, can be considered to user friendly so everybody according to their their particular orientation their particular consciousness their particular state they can find some some deity to worship they can find some conception of divinity that they will gravitate towards and that helps them become elevated now sometimes the vedic teaching is said, said that all paths lead to the same goal well that's a little bit of a over simplification there is some truth in it if you say if it is literally true say some people say krishna spoke in the gita that all paths lead to the same goal well from a purely logical perspective if that were the case then why does krishna have to even speak the gita you know even without krishna speaking the gita whatever arjuna does is going to all his, all his choices will lead to the same goal well it's not that simple it's not that all paths lead to the same goal rather there are many paths which are directed toward the same goal so all paths may be many many is not all many paths point toward the same goal but um, these many paths may not take us all the way to the same goal so for example if somebody is attracted to uh, the consumption of meat now to such a person might be attracted to a vision of divinity wherein also a part of the worship of the divinity is is the offering of meat the consumption of meat and they may be attracted to that and that that at least they are cons- if they become attracted then they are the divine is coming within the horizon of their consciousness so when ideally speaking when kali is worshiped sometimes they say that goats are to be sacrificed but the idea is there is a certain regulation in the sacrifice of the goats and the point is that some people are going to do it anyway so let them do it within a religious context that is they are at least as i said the divine is coming in the horizon of their consciousness over a period of time as their consciousness rises they will start becoming sensitized to the fact that oh this goat is also a living being and i'm causing pain to this now if all creatures are creatures of god would god be pleased Uh, if such pain is caused to a creature of god in the name of worshiping him so that as the consciousness rises in that way expands and the person will gradually give that up and they will move towards more uh, more harmonious more uh, harmonious forms of worship where the, the causing pain to others other life forms will not be there in it so in this way those so those who worship the devtas depending on which devta is being worshiped depending on uh what are the particularities of the worship it will all contribute to that one purpose of raising consciousness now how far the consciousness will raise will rise by the worship of that devta will depend on as i said how they are worshiping what are the kind of people they are associating with what is the overall conception of life and its purpose they are having so but it's progressive and eventually 
they will progress towards the ultimate under the understanding of the ultimate reality and uh, attainment of the ultimate reality it may take time as krishna says bahunam janmana mante it may take multiple lifetimes but it is on progressive on the path of spiritual evolution okay so thank you thank so you, prabhu ji thank, thank you very you. much for your very thoughtful thank questions i'm happy to be with all of you and gaur kumar prabhu as he introduced that we that he says we are together constantly so every day we discuss we exchange dozens of messages and all of you are fortunate to have him as your mentor and guide and uh, now whichever part of the world you are in presently which are part of the world you go few in future if you stay connected with him you will be sheltered in in wisdom and affection and that will be the path of auspiciousness for you so i am happy to be of some service to gaur kumar prabhu and to be of uh, some service to all of you in gaur kumar prabhu service to you thank you very much hey krishna shri chaitanya charan prabhu ki jai shri hari thank you prabhu thank you so much hey krishna thank you prabhu hey krishna thank you hey krishna hey krishna